Uh, it will be divided into two different uh, topics. Uh, in the first part of the lecture, uh, I will prove uh, for the first time in this course that uh, per collision is noise sensitive. So more precisely that uh, crossing events in critical per collision, they are noise sensitive. And to prove this, uh, we will use this theorem that was proved in the last lecture, which was the benjamin nikolai schramm theorem, uh, which uh, maybe I should recall it here. So the theorem was saying the following. If you take a sequence of Boolean functions, which are defined on the on this hypercube, so the number of variables might be much larger than n, for example. And say these uh, Boolean functions are 0, 1 valued, it could also be minus 1, 1 valued. If you know that uh, influences are small in this sense, in the sense that the sum over all the variables of the influence squared goes to 0, then we've seen that uh, the, the sequence of function has to be noise sensitive. So I will recall what it means exactly in our, in our case today, in the case of percolation. So the purpose today is to use this, uh, this theorem and basically to study the set of uh, the influences of the percolation crossings to deduce that the sequence of uh, uh, crossing events is indeed noise sensitive. And the second part of the lecture will be uh, uh, to apply these uh, techniques of Fourier analysis and KKL theorems and ideas that arise here in another context, the anomalous fluctuations in first passage percolation. So, let me uh, recall quickly uh, uh, what it means to be noise sensitive for the percolation event. So here we are taking, uh, as in Vincent's course and uh, also our course before, we are considering some rectangle. Say of a uh, doesn't have to be a squared, it could be like that. And we're looking at the event that there is a, an open path from left to right. So here we're on Z2, but uh, by approximating this rectangle by a triangular lattice, you could have the same Boolean function here. So I denote the rectangle by uh, R of N. And Fn will be this left to right crossing event that we used a lot so far. So what does it mean that uh, Fn is noise sensitive? It means that for any fixed level of noise epsilon, asymptotically, uh, the event Fn of omega and Fn of omega epsilon, they decorrelate completely. They become independent. OK, so asymptotically, asymptotically, when n goes to infinity, they're independent. So this can be written as follows, that the covariance of this observable with the slightly noised observable goes to zero. So remember that in the first course, uh, in the very first lecture, uh, I explained that noise sensitivity, uh, not only it, it says that these two uh, variables, which are zero, one valued, are asymptotically independent, but it somehow says more. It says the following, if you, so if you take your rectangle, 
what this says is that assume you know that for omega there is a left to right crossing. If now you know some of the bits, you lose the information. You cannot predict anymore if you still have your crossing or not. But in fact, noise sensitivity says more. Say you sample all your omega configuration. And you know all the, the bits here. So you maybe you see that here there is a very big cluster, which, which maybe is very fat, has many edges, uh, I don't know, something like that. So now, when you know a little bit your configuration, so here you, you will resample a very small proportion of the edges. All the, the, the geometric information which is here, uh, the knowledge on, of all the clusters and, uh, and so on, so now doesn't help you to predict anything about having a left to right crossing on the right or not. So, so now all the, all the geometric information here has been lost in the noising procedure. Nothing remains. So that's what I wanted to say when uh, noise sensitivity says that this and this are asymptotically independent, but in fact it says more. It says that the whole configuration, which in principle contains much more information, is uh, asymptotically independent of the outcome for the noised uh, version. Okay, so if you wanted to prove this uh, with end, like a uh, like a uh, proof using Russo Semo Welsh and so on, it, it's not obvious at all. Maybe you can think about it, but to make sense of the fact that all the information uh, is lost, uh, well, I think many people tried to, uh, to have a direct attack on this problem, but it's, uh, no, no one succeeded because somehow it's not so hard to prove that you would lose a little bit of correlation, because, for example, you might touch pivotal points which break your crossings or things like that. But to prove that sort of everything vanished, uh, no one knows how to do, except if you go through the Fourier story. So the only possibility we have is to study the Fourier spectrum, and somehow this uh, theorem was the first one who, who studied the Fourier spectrum of these uh, percolation crossings, the, these uh, crossing events. So now, if we want to use this, and if we want the course to be uh, rather self-contained, remember that uh, in the last lecture, I didn't really prove this uh, completely. I proved it uh, in a self-contained way only if this functional was going to zero quickly enough. Right? So what we proved was that uh, if there was some exponent delta, so that, such that this functional decreases polynomially fast towards zero, then we could, uh, we could conclude. And remember that if we didn't know that, so now things in this term are more complicated, we would need to use uh, estimates from Talagrand and things like that. So today, if we want to have a rather self-contained proof of noise sensitivity, we'd better achieve this uh, polynomial bond on the sum of the influences squared. So now, now, uh, somehow, with this theorem, we took care of the Fourier side. The only thing which uh, we have to do is to understand well enough the influences to see that this criterion is satisfied. So, study of influences of the influences of Fn. So, if you take this uh, rectangle R of n, and if you take an edge or a site in triangular lattice, we've seen many times already that for this site to be pivotal, so remember that the influence is the probability that uh, uh, the bit uh, is pivotal, we have to get the following picture. This point has to get an open arm from a uh, this side to this side, an open arm like this, and uh, dual arms going to these sides. Okay? So if we want to study the influences, we need to understand the probability of such an event here. So now, uh, so the, the influence of the edge E 
of f of n is the probability that this happens. And this is n and alpha times n. So now uh, imagine that this edge is somehow in the bulk, so in the middle of this square. Then take the uh, circle which where d is the distance from e to the boundary of the box. Then you notice the following. If your edge is pivotal, necessarily you have four arms uh, from your edge to the boundary of this circle. Right? So, so now let's move to this picture. Here I have some, uh, some sites here. Uh, well, wait, the picture is not so great. Uh, maybe this. So uh, if this site is open, white, then you'll have a, a long white connection in this circle. And if this is red, this is the jewel, which will have a, well, maybe here my, my primal is red and my jewel is, a, uh, is blue. So I already confused all the colors. Something like that. So, so this is like the zooming picture of, uh, of this thing. And this is a well-studied event that, uh, well, Vincent mentioned it in his, in his first course. And, uh, and this is uh, one of the uh, arms event in critical percolation. And from SLE, if you are in the triangular lattice, uh, the asymptotic when the radius r goes to infinity is known. If this is the radius r, when r goes to infinity using the SLE uh, uh, theory and the, the conformal invariance of percolation, uh, it's uh, non-trivial, but you can compute that this is uh, of order r to the minus 5 fourths plus little o of 1. So somehow this uh, gives us uh, non-trivial information about uh, how many pivotal points one should have and whether this criterion will be satisfied later on. So I will explain later in the case of the uh, square lattice Z2 what we can do because we don't have the critical exponents at our disposal. Okay, so here, uh, if you're far from the boundary, uh, this probability uh, in any case is less than having four arms from distance zero to distance d, right? Because you need to get these four arms. So here the notation was that the seventh, the property of the seventh, we'll call it the alpha four of r, meaning having four arms of a alternate color up to distance r. So now uh, let's look at the contribution to the BKS criterion here of the points which are reasonably far from the boundary. So if this is Rn, look at, say, half of the rectangle here, uh, Rn over 2. So how many points do we have in this, uh, in this rectangle? We have about n squared points. Number of points. Uh, no, sorry. So, what I would like is to bond from above uh, the contribution of the influences squared in this part of the bulk here. So, this is less than the number of the points. And now, how to bond their influence? If you take anything here, you will have to get four arm at least up to distance, say, uh, n over four. OK? So any uh, point here has an influence which is bonded from above by the four arm event up to this distance, this distance. So now what we get is that this is less than 
roughly n squared. And if we are on the triangular lattice, this contributes up to constant n to the minus 5 over 2 plus little o of 1. OK, so this small computation tells us that, more or less, uh, the contribution to the BK squared n of the points here contributes n to the minus 1 half plus little o of 1. So we're in good shape because what we'd like to have is a, to have a polynomial decay for the BK criterion. And that's what we end up with, at least for the points uh, which are in the bulk. So now what remains to do to be sure that percolation is noise sensitive is to understand uh, what is the boundary effect on the influences. So So somehow, if you look at uh, variables which are close to the boundary, the picture we had so far somewhat degenerates. For example, if you are here, and the distance uh, to the boundary is small, to be pivotal, you still need to have a, a four-arm event here, uh, maybe with color reversed. But but this won't be enough to, 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 to give a, an efficient double bond on your influences, so you need to describe a little more what's going on. Let's take the extreme case where the, the variable lies on the boundary here. So what configuration, what percolation configuration will make this variable pivotal? Well. The only case which uh, happens is the following. So this was all left to right uh, uh, edges. We need to have a, an open uh, pass up to this point, an open pass to this point. And if we flip it, uh, we want that the left to right crossing is killed. So we need a dual pass to come all the way to this point. OK, so uh, the probability that uh, variables on the boundary are pivotal uh, correspond to these pictures. So let us introduce the following critical exponents. Uh, so somehow here, we're not in the bulk anymore. We're in the half space. And let's look at the probability that uh, we get two open arms like this and one dual like that up to distance uh, r. And the probability of this, let's call it alpha 3. And to remember that we are in the upper half plane, let's call it like that. And this is called the three-arm event in the upper half plane. So this exponent of phi force is a non-trivial exponent in the sense that uh, you need the SLE to uh, compute such things. But in this case, it's uh, much easier. You can use Russo Seymour Welch. And I think Hugo maybe uh, did it in his uh, exercise sessions. This is one of the few universal exponents that is known both on the, the, the square lattice and on the triangular lattice. And this is known to be of order uh, up to constant these times. There are no little o of one corrections. And this is known to be like that. So. If you want a multi-scale version of it, uh, and you only want to have your three arms for, for, from reduce little r to reduce big r, then you get uh, the following thing, that the probability of this event from reduce little r to big r is also of order. OK, so somehow uh, uh, the exponents that uh, uh, describes the probability to be pivotal, what we've seen so far is that in the bulk, the exponent is 5 fourths. 
and near the edges, the exponent is uh, 2. Okay, and having a larger exponent corresponds to being much less likely. Right, so somehow this vague explanation seems to hint that uh, it's much more likely for a point to be pivotal in the bulk than it is to be pivotal near the boundary. So before uh, putting everything together, we still have one case to deal with, which is uh, near a corner here. So what happens when a, a variable gets near the corner? So let's study this case. So if you end up being near the corner, let's take the extreme case where your point is exactly uh, here. In order for this point to be pivotal, you need to have an open pass like that. And you need to have a dual pass which almost closes your crossing, right? So now you see that in the corner, you don't have a three-arm event anymore, but you have a two-arm event. So, so what is the probability that this happens? Let me introduce, again, another uh, critical exponent of percolation. But for a reason that will appear in a minute, I will introduce this one, still in the half plane but only, uh, only two arms. This. And that, so the probability of this, so now we want two arms and we want to be in the, in the upper half plane. This is another of the, these nice universal exponents that are known on any uh, percolation which satisfies also Simon Welsh. This is known to be of order uh, 1 over r up to constant. So this is a bond that we'll be able to use on z2 later. So now, uh, what does it tell us for the uh, probability that you are interested in, in, in this corner? Well, on the triangular lattice, uh, you, you can use this uh, conformal invariance principle. So what I will draw here will be vague, but this can be made rigorous. If you're interested into this event, so the probability of this event, you can use this uh, conformal invariance somehow to guess what the probability should be. So you can use the conformal map from the quarter plane to the upper half plane, which will map this picture to the picture here. So the radius now gets mapped to R squared, right? And the configuration, which uh, should be conform invariant, is mapped to this event. And we've just said that this event had probability uh, up to constants 1 over r, but the radius is r squared here. So by conformal invariance, we get that the probability of this event, which we'll denote by alpha 2, we want two arms, and this will mean that we are in the, in the corner. The probability of this event should be the same uh, but now we might have uh, corrections which come from the, we lose something in the conformal environment. So this whole thing says that somehow uh, we have an exponent which is 5 fourths for being pivotal in the bulk, an exponent which is 2 uh, for being pivotal on the edges, and near the corner this is also 2. So. So now the best place for a point to be pivotal is uh, near the middle here. And we've already taken care of these points which are more likely to be pivotal, so we should be done. So you might say, OK, but here I'm comfortable. Here it's unlikely that I'm pivotal. But what happens in the scales in between? 
So let me quickly sketch you how to put all these three exponents together, the bulk one, the boundary one, and the corner one. So So if you take uh, a point in your box, say here, let's consider the, the distance uh, from this point to the closest edge. Let's call it uh, N0. And let N1 be the distance from the closest corner uh, to the projection on the closest edge here. So let's say this point is uh, x. So now we'd like to bond from above the influence of these points. So what can we do? So ix of fn. Well, if you are a pivotal point, as we said before, you need to have uh, a four-arm event on this scale. But then uh, you also need to have a three-arm event from the scale N0 to the scale N1. So in this picture, I'm losing something because I'm, I don't even ask that these two arms are glued together. I'm just bonding from above. So I'm just saying that if you want to be pivotal, necessarily you have four arms here. You have three arms as in this picture. And then it's a bit harder to draw, but from the scale N1 to the scale N, you would have to get two arms like this. So if you draw this picture more properly on your, on your paper, you'll see that you can, these events uh, hold on disjoint places, so you can use the independence of the uh, bits in the percolation picture, and you get that this is less than having the forearm from distance zero to distance n zero, times having three arms from this intermediate scale n zero to the intermediate scale n one, in the upper half plane. So to be completely rigorous, I might lose, uh, might be from two times N zero times N one or things like that, but this won't change anything. And the last one is that I have to get uh, two arms in the corner from distance N one to the distance of all box. So now if uh, I use the information that we had so far, so here we have also the multi-scale version, which is like that. And I think I gave the uh, multi-scale version of the half plane one. We get that this is less than uh, n zero to the minus five fourths plus little o of one. And these are less than n0 divided by n1 to the power two. So the, there are constants involved here. And the last one is less than n1 over n to the power two plus little o of one. So in order to take care of the little o of one, you, you for any epsilon I was as small as you want, you can find a constant C positive, such that this whole thing is less than uh, a constant times N0 minus 5 fourths plus epsilon. This exponent is 2, but you may replace it by 5 fourths. You lose a little bit. Same thing here. So altogether, you get... Uh, five fourths minus epsilon 
phi force minus epsilon. And so you get this uniform bond, this uniform upper bond on the influences over the whole domain. Which tells you that for any point x in your rectangle, its influence is bonded from above by this. Okay? So here we, 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 <coughs> we use the fact that somehow the behavior of being pivotal is really dictated by, to, by what happens inside. And now we are done because if you sum all the influences squared, well, we have about n squared point and we get n to the minus 5 over 2 plus 2 epsilon, and this goes polynomially fast towards 0. So this takes care of the noise sensitivity on the triangular grid because we relied a lot uh, on two things. We used the 5 force exponent, which came from SLEs, and we used the, this exponent here, which used also the conformal invariance. So in Z2, what can we do? So in Z2, uh, on D2, the harder part is to have an estimate in the bulk. So we would have to remember this is the probability to have four arms like that. And we need to have a good upper bound on the property to be pivotal on the square grid. But here we don't have the SLEs to play with. So we need to have more indirect estimates. So maybe you've seen that. Uh, so there would be an easy estimate, but it doesn't go in the right direction. The five, the five arms even, this is in a TA session of Hugo. This is another. Uh, uh, of the universal critical exponent. This is known to be also in 1 over r squared. So you, you easily get that the 4R maven is much more likely than 1 over r squared because you ask less. So this, uh, you can prove that this is more than r to the minus 2 plus, and you gain some exponent. So what this tells you is that uh, so now you have many pivotal points in your picture with high probability. But what we'd like is an upper bound. So we'd like to say that uh, this is not so likely to have a point being pivotal in the bulk because we want the, inf the sum of the influences squared to, to go to zero. So what about an upper bound? So this is a slightly more delicate question and the, the first estimate that was proved in this direction was uh, Keston proved it. And somehow, uh, just to tell a small story, the, 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 the way he obtained an estimate like that, so if you read his paper, what he, what he has done is that he considers a slightly supercritical percolation in Z2. And somehow he proves that if you look at uh, supercritical percolation with P just a little above uh, PC. Then in windows, which are of size large windows like that, it proved that uh, for an exponent gamma, which is larger than 1, so it couldn't compute the exponent, of course, because it uh, didn't have the conformal invariance, but he had a bond on this exponent, it could prove that in these windows, which depend on how close you are from PC, somehow the supercritical percolation looks more or less exactly as the critical one. This is called the correlation length. 
And if you read this paper, I believe that somehow all of this is proved. And to get such a, a bond on the correlation length, you need to show that you don't have so many pivotal points. If you had many, somehow the, uh, the supercritical uh, geometry will uh, happen much faster. So somehow you can deduce from this whole work that uh, there is indeed an epsilon such that the, the four arm event in Z2 is not so high. It's less than R minus 1 minus epsilon. So the fact that the correlation is that high implies exactly this bond here. And somehow this is exactly what we want because when we, uh, when we sum the points in the bulk, so the points here, again, they are R squared of these. And if we have this Keston bond, we get that this will go polynomially fast towards zero. So Keston provides us with the answer in the, in the bulk. There is another way to obtain this upper bond on the uh, four-arm event. And this was done by uh, Benjamin Nicolai and Schramm in the same paper. So somehow they knew about Keston's result, but I'm not sure they could exactly uh, 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 find it uh, in the paper. So somehow they had a completely different way of, uh, uh, of obtaining this. And their idea, maybe Jeff will explain a little bit of it. Uh, the idea was that uh, if you have a Boolean function, which, is, which happens to be very little correlated with majority functions, somehow its inferences have to be very small. And so they looked at correlation of the crossing events with majority functions. And they, 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 they've seen using randomized algorithm, which will, explain, uh, which will be explained in the next lecture, they noticed that indeed this is very uh, badly correlated with majority. And they proved using that that influences are small. And therefore, these kind of exponents uh, are high enough. OK, so I'll stop with this bulk discussion. But we have the tools to to take care of the bulk case. Now, what about the boundary? So uh, here I'll quickly mention the boundary. So uh, here we still get this universal exponent near the edge, right? The, I mentioned before that the, the probability to have three arms like this was also known on Z2 to be 1 over R squared. The problem is that uh, in the corner, uh, we cannot use conformal invariance, so we need to, to work a little bit more. And I won't have time to do it, but it's done caref rather carefully in the notes. But somehow the, the idea is to uh, to use this event here to obtain an upper bound on the corner event here. And what's not so great is that we have an upper bound which gives an exponent 1 near the corner. And here in Z2, remember that in the bulk, we get 1 plus epsilon using Keston, for example. So, so now, now the corner doesn't beat the, the bulk case anymore, so we need to work a little bit more to conclude that indeed on Z2, we have a noise sensitivity for the crossing event. So, OK, so I won't, uh, I won't go into more details. You can look into the, the notes. Uh, so now, uh, let me just give a, a remark. So we, in this whole thing, we, we studied carefully what is the BKS criterion, the sum of the influences squared. If we wanted to look at the total influence, which is just the sum of the influences over x in Rn, a careful study will also give us that this is uh, given by the bulk. So namely, we have about n squared points in the bulk, and the influences uh, are this uh, four-arm event. So when you don't have squares here and you just want the total influence, also the boundary doesn't give uh, uh, important contributions. 
And in the triangular lattice, this quantity here that will happen, uh, that will arise often in the uh, rest of the lectures, this quantity is n to the minus 3 fourths plus little o of 1. So just remember that in this box, you have in the bulk n squared points. Each of these points have n to the minus 5 fourths uh, probability to be pivotal on the triangular lattice. Oh, sorry. So this gives this quantity here. OK, and this is uh, somewhat interesting because we call that in the second lecture, uh, Jeff explained everything about sharp threshold. So this tells you that if you take, uh, if you plug here the probability depending on the bias p in percolation that there is a left to right crossing, well, this has the following shape. This has a sharp threshold and this n to the three fourths here tells you about how sharp it is somehow. What's the derivative exactly at one half? So now just notice the following. So this enables us to understand sharp threshold. Instead of taking the left to right crossing in this box Rn, so you have n squared bits here. Say you would take another Boolean function, the majority function, which would tell you, okay, I have more pluses than minuses, more open edges than closed edges. So the majority on these uh, n squared bits, it also has a sharp threshold. And just notice the following, the sharp threshold of this one is much, much sharper. Okay, majority feels much more quickly the change in, in P. Because if you compute, you have n squared bits, and you remember the total influence of majority was square root of the number of bits. So the derivative is n, which is much larger than for percolation. OK, so <clears throat> so now quickly, I'd like to uh, spend five, 10 minutes on what we achieved so far about the noise sensitivity of percolation, and uh, in particular, what remains to be understood. So, uh, and for this, I'd like to introduce the, the concept of quantitative, quantitative noise sensitivity. So just to motivate quickly, uh, the model will be defined uh, rigorously by Jeff, but I, I sort of defined it uh, uh, in vague terms in this uh, uh, Beamer presentation the first day. If you take dynamical percolation at time t, and you look at it in a window of size n, what you see is a just a critical uh, percolation configuration. So you see big open clusters here. And that would be the omega t configuration. If you wait, if you let the dynamical percolation move a little bit, so uh, sites are uh, updated according to Poisson point process. If you wait a little bit and you look at the configuration here, we say that for large n at omega t plus epsilon, epsilon fixed and n going to infinity, what we see here at large scale is completely independent of what we had before. And somehow this geometric mixing property uh, should be the reason why at the very end of this course we'll get exceptional times where uh, infinite clusters appear in this dynamics. But now to, to, to actually prove that you have these exceptional times, we have this mixing property over time, but we we would like to know at which speed uh, the process mixes, right? So we, we see that at fixed slices like that, the process has completely mixed, but it's, it would be uh, interesting and it will be crucial to know what is the speed uh, of the, uh, at which speed the geometry uh, completely uh, loses its memory. So somehow, uh, instead of looking at time epsilon, 
we'd like to, to, to look at time epsilon n, small, which will depend on the size of our system. So in back to our Boolean function, we take a sequence of Boolean function f of n. And now we'd like to make our definitions more quantitative. We'd like to know, assume it's noise sensitive, for which uh, sequences of noise epsilon n going to zero, do you still have that this decorrelation property that fn of omega is independent of fn of omega epsilon? And if you remind the second lecture uh, by Jeff, where he introduced Fourier analysis, when you look at the uh, energy spectrum of your Boolean function, so we call that this was a, a EF of k, the energy spectrum of f of n at layer k. This was the sum of the frequencies of size k of at fns squared. And if we want to know at which speed the process loses its memory, it's ex exactly equivalent to know at which speed. Uh, so if we know that the sequence of Boolean function is noise sensitive, we know it has to be the case. We know that its spectral mass diverges to infinity. And if we want things to be more quantitative, if we want to know how noise sensitive it is, we need to answer the question, the following question, at which speed uh, uh, does the spectral mass diverge to infinity? So, so in our particular case of the percolation crossings, we'd like to know at which speed the Fourier mass of these Boolean functions, they go to infinity. And so now, uh, if you recall the last lecture, we proved in this first part that the BKS quaternion goes to zero polynomially fast. And in the last lecture, uh, this actually told us something about the spectrum. So the, there was a theorem in the last lecture that said that if the BKS quaternion goes polynomially fast towards zero, then we know that the spectral mass diverges to infinity at least logarithmically fast. So from the last lecture and from the fact that the sum of the influence C squared is less than uh, n to a minus, uh, so in Z2 we would have some exponent coming from Keston, and on the triangular lattice we even add minus one half. We get that there exists some constant such that the sum over all these frequencies goes to zero as the size of the system goes to infinity. So in this picture, it means that if f of n are the percolation crossing, then at least up to a logarithmic cutoff, asymptotically there is no there is some, but there is very little contribution of the Fourier spectrum here. So if you translate it in terms of, uh, of Fourier coefficients, sorry, of uh, noise sensitivity, a simple exercise shows you that if you choose any sequence of uh, noises in such a way that the noise is much larger than one over log n, then you get that fn of omega and fn of omega epsilon n decorrelate completely. The, the covariance goes to zero. So using this first way of understanding noise sensitivity, this benjamin nikolai schramm theorem, uh, already we obtain some quantitative bond on uh, how quickly the spectrum diverges to infinity. So now we may wonder, uh, is it just a logarithmic sen noise sensitivity, or can we do better? So let us try to have an upper bound on 
how fast the spectrum goes to infinity. So the first answer is uh, uh, very easy. So So asking at which speed the spectrum diverges to infinity is basically asking about the noise stability regime of percolation. Namely, uh, you'd like to know for which sequences of noise the probability that Fn of omega is different from Fn of omega epsilon n uh, goes to zero. So it's the opposite situation. You'd like to know if I know just very little bit my percolation configuration, I would like things to be stable. I would like my percolation configuration to look almost the same. So it's easy to see that uh, you cannot be too demanding if epsilon n is very small say if this is less than 1 over n squared. Well, here it's obvious because uh, in a window of size, of size n, you have about n squared bits. Having this much smaller than this, it means that basically uh, no bits will be resampled in the picture. So with high priority, this will be exactly equal to this, and you're done. So this is not very conceptual, but we can do a bit better using information from percolation. And we can do the following. If epsilon n is much smaller than 1 over the total influence of a function, and this is true for Boolean functions in general. So on the triangular lattice, uh, on, on Z2, this is about 1 over n squared alpha 4 of n. And on the triangular lattice, this is about n to the minus 3 fourths plus little o of 1. If the noise is that small, uh, we'll see that things have to be stable. And how can we prove that? Well, let us proceed as follows. So, This is our rectangle for percolation crossing. So we have about n squared bits in this thing. Let's assume we have exactly n squared bits, say n squared edges. And let's order these as follows. x n squared. So these represent uh, edges ordered in a certain way. And now let us see how you produce uh, an epsilon n configuration, a noise configuration out of this one. So this is sampled according to the uniform measure. So recall that to obtain the omega epsilon and configuration, the noising procedure was as follows. For each bit, independently of the others, you resample the bit with probability epsilon n, epsilon n. So we can do it algorithmically as follows. For any i uh, in 1 n squared, what we'll do is a very simple idea. We'll just resample our bits one at a time. Let's introduce omega i. i plus 1, x i n squared, where uh, y of i's are the bits that were resampled with probability uh, epsilon of n. So notice that this string of bits still follows the uniform measure p of, p of n on, on, the, on the hypercube. And now, uh, so you get that omega equals omega 0. And then you get omega 1 and all the way to omega n squared, which is 
exactly follows exactly the law that you want in this coupling of omega and omega epsilon. And now you bond this noise stability criterion as follows. The probability that Fn of omega is different from Fn of omega epsilon n is less than the sum of uh, all i's, the probability that Fn of omega i minus 1 is different from Fn of omega i. OK, and now let's think a little bit about what is this. <coughs> so from omega i to omega i plus 1, or omega i minus 1 to this, the only thing you change is this bit. Right? With probability 1 minus epsilon of, of n, you don't do anything. With probability epsilon of n, you resample. So it means that half of the time you don't do anything, and half of the time you flip the bit. So using the, the definition of the influence, this is exactly the sum of all the bits of the probability that you flip the bit, and this is epsilon n over 2, times the probability that this bit is pivotal. And that gives you uh, the influence of this variable. And now the total influence, the sum of uh, the influences, appears naturally here. We get that this is epsilon n over 2 times the total influence of a Boolean function. So somehow, if you're much smaller than the inverse of the total influence, there is no way you can, uh, you can decorrelate. And if, so it's another exercise, if you think of noise stability and noise sensitivity in terms of the Fourier spectrum, this tells you that the, the Fourier mass cannot diverge more quickly than the total influence, uh, which here is n squared alpha 4 of n. And if you want something in terms of exponent on the triangular lattice, this is of order n to the 3 fourths. So, so now the spectral uh, mass of uh, percolation crossings has to lie somewhere in between the logarithmic term here and the n to the 3 fourths. So the techniques that come from the KKL theorems and uh, using this hypercontractivity that maybe you didn't like so much last time because it was very computational, they cannot uh, push your spectral mass faster than log n. So the goal of the rest of these lectures is to uh, find new techniques, completely different ones, to try to localize the spectral mass in a, in a less wide regime and to have a better understanding of how noise-sensitive percolation is. So I thought it would take uh, much less time, but now we'll uh, switch to the second part of the lecture. So, <coughs> so this part is, a, is about an application to something which still has percolation in the title, but somehow this is a, of a very different flavor. So, um, so this will be about the anomalous fluctuation of a uh, first percolation. So first, a few words about the model. So here we take the grid ZD. So it's the only time in this course where we can do things uh, also in a higher dimension. And If you take any edge E, what we do is that we want to define a, a, a random metric on this grid. And we'll proceed as follows. 
will denote by two of e the, the, the length of this edge e. And this will be equal to some parameter a with probability one half and to some parameter b with probability one half, where these lengths will be taken to be fixed and to be like that. So you have your grid and you have all these uh, random lengths attached to each edge. And now you may wonder uh, about the properties <coughs> of this random metric. So maybe your goal would be to, to describe some of these properties. So one way to picture a little bit how the uh, how things behave in this uh, random geometry, we can look at balls of large radius. So since the model is completely invariant by translation, we can look at the balls around the origin, for example. So let us look at, uh, I just forgot something. So here, the randomness in this random geometry can be encoded uh, by a string of bits, right? And there is one bit attached to each edge of the ZD lattice. Okay, so the random geometry is encoded by some configuration on this infinite uh, hypercube. So now to each, so the, the ball is random and we can look at the ball of radius T which is uh, the set of points which are at distance uh, less than t from the origin. So the distance here is the obvious thing when you have two points, x and y. You look at all the paths that go from one to the other and you look at their length and you minimize. So. Uh, one way to think of it, and that's uh, often what they do in first passage percolation, you may think of pumping in water at the zero's vertex, and imagine the water takes A units of time to travel through these edges, and B units of time to travel through the other edges, and somehow this uh, ball at time T is the region that has been uh, uh, wetted uh, at time T. So if you draw this, uh, this region in the Z2 in the ZD lattice, you'll get some ball, a random ball. But so now this is a, and this is a, a bout of reduce. A, well, this shouldn't be spherical, but this is a, a distance about t. This is not very hard to show that uh, there is a kind of geometric law of large number law of large numbers which tells you that asymptotically this converges as t goes to infinity towards the deterministic shape mystic convex shape and the way to see it is a, a little bit like in polymers, or it, it just arises all over the place, is to use subadditivity And very quickly, the way it, for it, uh, it works is that uh, if you take some direction, e to the i theta, the distance from the origin to n times this direction. So here I would need to use a, a this, but let's not let's not worry here. This will be less. Uh, it's maybe let's write it like that. This will be less than this distance from zero to this. plus the distance for some shifted uh, 
configuration from 0 to this. And the idea is very simple. It's just that you want to go all the way to this uh, n plus m this. And you're saying that, so there is some geodesic that satisfies the minimal distance. And you're saying that uh, a way to create a, a rather small pass is to go first to this uh, n i, I, e i theta, and then from this point to this point, and using the invariance of this model. So of course, the geodesic in real uh, most likely will not go through this point, but this is just an upper bound. And this subattitivity property, uh, this is a classical thing from probability. You can use it to obtain that 1 over n, the distance of this, this converges to a limit which depends on theta and which is positive. And somehow the uh, the asymptotic ball that we have here is described by the radial function 1 over L of theta. OK, so it's not very hard to see that uh, the large scale properties of this random matrix are, in a, in a certain sense, determinist. And now we'd like to study the fluctuations around these uh, uh, deterministic shapes. So let's, let us take for a second the case of uh, the case of the uh, dimension one case. So here things are very easy. You, you have z, and to each edge, you assign to it a length which is a or b. So it's just the classical law of large number. You know that the ball of radius t will be uh, you can compute everything. And you know that the fluctuation around this ball will be exactly described by the central limit theorem. So in the one-dimensional case, you know that fluctuations, they are, uh, uh, from the CLT, they are Gaussian. OK? So now, what about the higher-dimensional case? So we have this. Uh, geometric law of large number, which tells us that there is some shape like that. And when the, the mesh is very small, the actual random uh, ball is uh, fluctuating around it. And so you might wonder, uh, what are the order of fluctuations? So this was studied a lot. And maybe here's a summary of some of the results. <clears throat> so, uh, so the fluctuations around around the asymptotic shape. Um, the first theorem was uh, by Keston. He proved that the fluctuations. Uh, are at most of the other square root of n. So this is, if it's, if it's the ball of size uh, of radius roughly n, the, it fluctuates at most by a factor of square root of n. So this was done by uh, uh, Keston. And uh, so this sort of did not exclude maybe a similar behavior as in the one-dimensional case. It could still be a Gaussian behavior around the deterministic shape. But in some specific cases, um, okay, so maybe just a trivial thing here is that we know that this is little o of n because we have this subadditivity which tells us that there is a, something deterministic. So this was a big improvement. In some specific cases, and in fact, in the, in the in case of directed models of last passage percolation, uh, for very special uh, random lows on the edges, uh, it was proved to be of the order n to the one third. And this was done by 
Johansson. So this was a, a big result. It sort of showed that the phenomenon is very different here. Fluctuations are much smaller than the bond given by Keston. And if you believe in uh, universality, uh, as in the Vincent's course, in percolation or things like that, this uh, uh, behavior should be the same for all the models of this kind. So you could change the law that I described here. You could take anything reasonable, and you should expect this n to the one-third. And it would not be Gaussian anymore, and the, the law that you would get, so if you renormalize the fluctuation, so minus uh, the mean divided by n to the one-third. What Johansson proved in this case is that you get the tracy uh low distribution. So somehow, uh, around this shape, things fluctuate exactly as the uh, highest eigenvalues of random matrices. So there is something nice which seems to be, uh, which could be understood here, but the situation in generality is really far from that. And there was a big improvement by uh, Benjamin Nicolai and Schwamm, which said that the fluctuation are, well, there is still a long way to this, but uh, smaller than this uh, square root of n, which you could still be Gaussian and things like that. So the purpose today, uh, in the last 15, 20 minutes, is to have a, an idea why this, why this holds. So, uh, <clears throat> So let me first state the theorem more precisely. So, <clears throat> okay, so if you take uh, any vertex v on Zd, so there exists a universal constant C positive, such that if you take any uh, any vertex v, the variance of the distance from the origin to the vertex v, which is a random variable, so you can look at the variance, this will be bounded from above by c times the distance to the origin in log of this. Okay? So somehow you, it might remind you of uh, many of these KKL theorems and things like that that we had. And in some sense, this is intimately related. So, we'll, we'll, we'll try to understand this type of fluctuation in a slightly simpler case. In the case of the torus instead of the, the ZD lattice, and things will be simpler because we'll have a lot more invariance to play with. So let's look at the torus C of M, which is Z M Z over D in dimension D. So something like that. And now let us look at a quantity which is a metric quantity to have to understand why uh, metric properties fluctuate uh, less than that. So what we can look at is the uh, circumference of uh, this random metric here. So we can look at the shortest, shortest path along this axis here. So we look at all the gamma paths that cross this axis, and we look at the shortest distance. So this is a function of all data here, the omega, of, uh, which, tells us, which tells you about all the random lengths. And let's call it uh, uh, like that, the circumference of, for the size n uh, of the torus. And this can be think uh, not exactly as a Boolean function, but as a real valued function, which is defined on this hypercube of all the bits here. So they are about. Uh, n squared bits. And this is not Boolean anymore because uh, this could take many values, right? So 
So this goes into R. So now, even though this is not Boolean, we are not so far from the setup we had in the last lecture. Because the for any edge E, you may look at the discrete derivative along the edge E of this quantity, which is the smallest uh, uh, circumference. So this is uh, this minus this when you flip the edge E. And this function is very close to the discrete derivative of Boolean functions that we had because it takes value into 0 if nothing changes. It could be b minus a if you change uh, one edge from uh, e to b and you are forced to increase the shortest geodesic, or minus b minus a. So b and a, they're fixed parameters, so uh, it doesn't cost much to uh, we, we scale the whole thing, and we may assume to be in the same setup as before that this discrete derivative take values into this minus one zero one. So we call that this was very uh, very nice because uh, using the hyper contractivity and so on, so the LP norms had very nice relationships between each other. So now that we're closer to the setup we had before. You get the same thing as uh, in the Boolean case. You get that the variance of your function, and in general, the variance of your function f, is less than the sum of the influences. And here, we are not Boolean, but we can still define the influence of the edge e as the probability that the edge e makes a difference on the circumference, or in other words, as the L1 norm or the L2 norm squared of this thing. So here I'm not worrying about B minus A factors. So Poincaré's inequality gives us a way to obtain an upper bound on the fluctuation of this quantity here. And somehow uh, we'll see later that the question result exactly corresponds to a Poincaré's inequality bound. So in this uh, uh, array here, if you, if you want to improve on the Poincaré's Poincar inequality to, to, to get smaller fluctuations, exactly as in the KKL stories, we'd like to prove that uh, if we show that influences are small, So if we manage, looking at this model, if we have a way to see that each edge influence very little on the outcome, then exactly as in the Boolean setting, we'll improve on the Poincaré inequality by showing that the variance of f will be, in fact, much smaller than the total influence. And this much smaller will be, again, with this logarithmic term, which is sharp in general. So of course, here it's not sharp, because we expect n to the one third, but if you had any functions like that, you couldn't do better. So the goal now is first to understand why influences in this case are small, and then to see how in this KKL technology, well, there's not so much time left, but why uh, does it indeed imply uh, this bond on the fluctuations? So let me now uh, study the influences. <coughs> So at first sight, you may think, you may think, okay, the influences should be exactly the probability to be on a geodesic, right? So, uh, uh, 
you may think, OK, I, if that's a geodesic, if I take this edge, the probability of an edge might be the probability that you are exactly on a geodesic. Well, that's not completely true because uh, a geodesic, you might have many of these. A little bit uh, later, like in the, in the course of Jean-Francois and Gregory, uh, you will have many geodesics and, uh, in the planar maps and things like that. So it's not true that the probability of being pivotal is exactly the probability to lie on a geodesic. So, and in the other direction, you might not lie on a geodesic, but if you flip it to a smaller length, you might, the geodesic might actually choose to go through this point. So, what we do is that we may have a, a, a bunch of geodesics running along the, the, the torus. Let us choose a gamma tilde among all of these geodesic in an invariant way. So, for example, let us choose this uniformly among all geodesics. So, so now what happens? So let us look at the discrete derivative at edges E. The probability that you increase the length when you flip the edge E, this is less than the probability that E lies on this particular geodesic. So why is that? Well, uh, if by flipping an edge E you increase the length, it means that all the, all the geodesics, they have to go through this particular edge, right? Because if you had a shortcut, it wouldn't make a difference. So all the geodesics have to enter this edge E, and in particular, this one that we selected here. So we get this, this bone. So now by by symmetry, by invariance of the flipping procedure and the uniform measure, this thing is exactly the same as this. And somehow, uh, slightly more indirect way of, of seeing is, is this is that this is less than the probability that E is in the geodesics of the flipped configuration here. So what it gives us is that the probability that you make a change, which is the influence of the variable E, is less than twice the probability to lie on this random geodesic. So now we're in good shape because Geodesics, they cannot be, geodesics can't be uh, too long. And the reason for this is that it's easy to see that the circumference is always larger than A times N, because in the best case, you would have a circuit completely flat with uh, all values being equal to A. And the worst case is if everything is equal to B, right? But in that case, you can still have this upper bound on the, on the length. So somehow this says that uh, the length of the geodesics will always be smaller than this. OK? So now. The nice thing about looking at the torus instead of the initial case is that it's very invariant. So in particular, any edge should have the same influence. This is not completely right because edges which lie in this direction do not play exactly the same role as the edges which are orthogonal to this. But uh, that doesn't cause much problem. So if you sum over all the edges in the torus of the probability that they 
uh, of that they are influential, i x of uh, of n. This is uh, this is equal to the sum of uh, this is less sorry than the sum of uh, all the edges of the probability to be on the geodesic. And now what this is, this is exactly twice the expected size of the geodesic, right? So we get that this is less than uh, a constant times n. But now what is this? I say that using invariance, all edges have the same influence with this uh, subtlety here, but it, it's easy to take care of that. How many variables do we have? We have of order n to the d variables, right? We are in dimension d. They all, all have same influence. So we obtain that the influence of any edge is less than some constant times n to the 1 minus d. And when d is larger than 2, it, gives, it shows us that influences are very small. So now how to conclude? So you're lucky because I won't do the computations you might have disliked last time. When you write the variance of a, a function which might not be Boolean, from minus 1 into R, but which is such that uh, is discrete derivative R in minus 1, 0, 1. So this variance, you can exactly write it like that, sum over the variables, sum over the frequencies, non-empty of 1 over s times this. So this is like an exact formula. And this gives a slightly uh, faster way to explain to you the heuristics of last time, but with a disadvantage that it doesn't tell you anything about its proof. So if you have small influences, we've seen that this means that the L1 norm so you can think of f as being our function here, which is the L2 norm squared of this. You can think of it as being small. That's what the small influence tells you. And we say that the, this weyl eisenberg uncertainty uh, should imply that frequencies are pushed toward high frequencies. And it tells you here that if you're pushed toward high frequencies by this principle, this should be much less than the sum over k of sum over s of the same thing but without that. And if you recall your formula, you can see that this is exactly the total influence. Okay? So, uh, so here in this uh, heuristics, what was a little bit uh, computational was that we needed to use hyper-contractivity to make sense of this weyl eisenberg uncertainty, which say that frequencies are pushed really high. So if you use this technology uh, here of hyper-contractivity and so on, and this is almost the same as what we've done in the third lecture, you obtain a, we have a polynomial decay on our influences here, and we obtain that variance of this uh, is less than some constant divided by the number of the log of the number of variable times the sum of all the influences. So now what is the sum of all the influences? Well, this is less than 1 over log n. We have n to the d variables. We have this bond. So if you sum them all, you get that this is the total influence is less than n. OK? So you, we indeed obtained the uh, benjamin nikolai theorem in the case of the torus, where we used a lot of invariance. And somehow, Keston results 
which was that variance of this is less than, uh, so if you use Poincare's inequality, you get that this is less than the sum of influences. And if you don't want to use any hypercontractivity or anything, this argument, which is just first percolation argument, tells you that indeed this total influence is less than some constant times n. Okay, so this idea about the influences imply to you Keston's uh, result. And if you want to use more this, uh, this property that influences are small and to go into this technology, you gain a factor of log n. So just in one minute, uh, I wanted to spend on it 20. I'll try to compress it in one minute, so maybe it won't make much sense. But uh, somehow in the original statement of uh, Benjamin Nikolai Schwamm, when you take two points and you want to know the fluctuation of the distance from this point to a point which is far, you have a problem in this scenario, which is that it's not true that all influences are small. Right? Because, for example, these four edges, they are highly influential on the outcome. Because, uh, I mean, the geodesic has to enter one of these four, so if you flip one of these four, you, you'll have positive influence. And same here. And somehow the whole technology didn't work if, uh, if well, it could still work here, but even in the middle, and that was even a bigger problem, there is no invariance as in the torus, so they couldn't have this soft argument sort of averaging around the torus to get uh, upper bounds like that, so they were, they were stuck. And they had the following nice idea, which was instead of looking at the function f, which is the distance from the origin to v, they used the following uh, averaged idea. So they said, I'm really interested in uh, the distance from this to this. But let me noise a little bit the starting points. So they took some mesoscopic box here and here. And with some additional randomness, they would pick uh, sort of at random a point in this box and the same point here. And they would look at the slightly perturbed function f of tilde, which would be the distance not from the origin, but from this random point to this target here. And so now with this additional randomness, they don't have the full invariance that you have on the torus, but somehow to any geodesic that would go from this to this, there is this invariance along the mesoscopic box. So they can use this averaging argument here and that, that give us, that give them upper bound on the influences. And somehow to conclude the argument, you just need to observe that f and the noise f of tilde are pretty close to each other because this distance cannot be very different from this one because you can always uh, brute force do that. And this tells you that the fluctuation of this cannot be too far from the fluctuations of this one, and you're done. So there is a lot of things I couldn't say here. In particular, the, the additional randomness that you use if you want to apply this program you want this additional randomness to be defined also in an hypercube somehow, and you need the influences that you use in your additional randomness to be small and things like that. But somehow the idea was, I think, very nice to extend somewhat the ideas of the torus to the case of the uh, plane. So I, I'll finish here. <laughs> Questions? Or?